What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDG. Big dogs got to eat. Today, we're talking pro days because that has been the talk of the town for the last week, two weeks, whatever, whatever. Pro day season is it's out of pocket. It's gotten so far out of fucking hand. Because there was no NFL combine, we have these pro days happening with each school. So players are doing them on different dates. Players are running on different fields. They are running at different times in different locations, different altitudes. Some of them have their fucking janitors reporting with their stopwatch. Like shit is getting out of hand. I've never seen anything like this. There, there's more standout performances at pro days this year than ever before. Today, we're going to talk about the ones that stood out the most, okay? Not every player had a pro day that was like, holy shit, my eyes are opened, or holy shit, I will now close my eyes to these players. But some of them did, okay? And there are takeaways from all of these athletic measurable things. I know a lot of you guys are going to be in the comments like, this doesn't matter, doesn't matter what a guy does in his fucking tights and his spandex compared to being on the field. And like, okay, go fucking prove that, sure, okay. These types of numbers tell you how athletic a player is relative to other NFL players. So these are important. If a running back is going to run a 4.78, I don't give a fuck that you thought he looked good on film. If you run a 4.78, 40-yard dash, you're not an NFL player. You're not an NFL running back, I should say, okay? You're not going to be a successful NFL running back. So everything that happens at these pro days, everything that happens at the combine, everything that happens with these athletic measurables are to give you an idea of how athletic, how fast, how strong each player is relative to actual NFL players. Because we have a lot of guys that come from smaller schools. We have a lot of guys that come from, you know, the non-Alabamas. And guess what? When you turn on their film, they better be fucking chopping it up against Louisiana, Tech State, Cal Poly, University, College community of, of New York, of also of New Hampshire, too. You better be fucking chopping it up against those schools, all right? If you're not, you got a problem. So every running back who is an NFL, I don't care if you're projected to be a sixth or seventh round player. If you're not embarrassing every player on the field from those schools, you've got a problem. And it's going to look like you're running a 4-4. So when everyone's like, oh my God, that guy looks extremely fast and elusive, looks like a legit NFL player. Of course, you're going to look like that against non-relative NFL athletes. So these measurables are a way to consolidate all of the players together. They're a way to look at each individual player and say, Okay, he is NFL ready. Okay, he is actually fast, despite what some guy on fucking Twitter or in a YouTube comment said about what he looks like in a film on one day in fucking October of 2019. Okay, sorry. A lot of anger coming out of me today. I'm stressed. I got a lot on my mind. We've got the Dynasty Rookie Guide soft launch, I believe, is going up tomorrow. We're going to say fuck it. We've been working hard on it. I, I, you know, We can't keep it behind the scenes any longer. If any of you guys pre-ordered it, you can go log in on bdge.store right now. The email that you purchased the draft guide with will be able to log you in on that store. You'll be able to look at every single rookie profile and all the stuff we have in the guide. If you haven't yet purchased it, there it is, bdge.store. I'm still looking at apartments. Right after this video, I got to shoot down to the Lower East Side. I'm looking at four fucking apartments in a row. Chop, 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 chop. I know they're all going to fucking stink. Then I'm going to have to continue looking. So I'm stressed out. These pro days got me more stressed than Andy Reid at a fucking barbecue because you go in with one projection of a player like, yeah, we know he's going to be, you know, six foot, 215 pounds, run a four six forty, And all of a sudden they decide to go on a diet and come in 13 pounds less. They're running 40s that are you know, half a second faster. It makes no damn sense. So we got to break down the things we saw, the things we didn't see. Don't hear what I'm not saying. You had guys that were supposed to run in the four threes, running in the four fives. You got dudes who were supposed to run in the four sixes, couldn't break away a 30 yard fucking touchdown run if their life was on the line. And all of a sudden they're putting up Usain Bolt numbers. Something's got to give here. Okay. We're going to break it down position by position. And we're going to break down the most notable pro days that we just didn't see coming. Okay. I believe all the pro days are in the books. All the numbers are still being finalized. I use Player Profiler to organize and get the concrete numbers for all of these prospects, as I believe you should as well, because they use multiple sources. They adjust for the fact that everybody's not on a combine. They add a half of a tenth of a second to the combine number. So if you run a 4.60 at your pro day, you're going to run a 4.65 official on the website. That was a long intro. I apologize. Welcome, bike. Tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. All 
All right, so typically there's there's not much to take away from pro days when it comes to the quarterbacks. Uh, there are a couple top five guys I want to touch on very, very quickly. First is Justin Fields. Justin Fields came in and ran a 4-5-1 40-yard dash. We knew he was fast. We knew he could run. We knew he could scramble. And the beautiful thing about that, him proving that to us is, you know, even if you don't think the, the fucking hate for Justin Fields over the last couple weeks doesn't really make any sense to me. I think people just get bored and then the takes shit. Every single player's, like, graph of hate love during – pro day season and combine season is just like this it's like people don't people don't know about them so everybody has to act like they're undervalued and they're the first player to call them a sleeper and thus everybody else starts to know about them and the popularity gets high and then people are like wait we like him too much we got to start hating him again so it's always just like people trying to be first to fucking everything it's super annoying which is why i try to stay off twitter during these times justin fields four five one forty even if you don't believe in his arm you can't not believe in the legs, okay? He's a guy who has averaged nearly 40 rushing yards a game over the last two seasons. He has scored 15 times with his legs over the last two seasons. So the floor is going to be there for Justin Fields. Obviously, you know, we don't know where he's going to land because if he lands in a spot where, you know, the Falcons are probably not going to draft a guy like Justin Fields anymore because we restructured Matt Ryan's contract. But per se, you know, it, what if he does? What if they do end up taking Justin Fields at four? He's going to be sitting behind him for a year, right? So we don't want to go ahead and say he's a top whatever rookie pick because we don't know the actual landing spots, okay? Most of these quarterbacks who are going off in the top 10 picks will likely be the starter right away. Maybe a guy like Trey Lance might not be whatever. He might be a little bit of a project, might take a year to get into it. But Justin Fields right out the gate, I think provides a ridiculously high floor. And he's someone, again, if you don't believe in the in the arm, the legs are going to be there. I don't understand why he can't. He, he, he I think he'll be Jalen Hurts with probably more pocket presence, which is a phenomenal phenomenal fantasy quarterback so Justin Fields big winner running that 4-5-140 yard dash Zach Wilson nothing from the numbers but from what I saw he looked fantastic he's a guy that's rising up my board because everybody hates him so much everyone in Dynasty Twitter hates him so much that I'm starting to like him I just want to throw a quick note in there starting to I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say I'm planting a flag on Zach Wilson but he is someone who I'm feeling more more and more and more comfortable with but let's go over to the meat of the episode okay let's go over to the fucking pastrami the salami oh, i love deli meat so much the pepperoni of the episode and that is the skill position players wide receivers and running backs we'll we'll, we'll rip off the wide receivers first and jamar chase listen it, it should come as no fucking surprise that this guy is fast and he's strong and he's athletic of course we have to go nuts about it and pretend again that we're like planting our flag on it. You know, one guy's like, oh my God, I love Jamar Chase. And one guy's like, no, I love Jamar Chase. The next guy's, I have him as my rookie wide receiver one. I have him as my overall wide receiver one. The next guy comes in, I have him as my fucking overall number one player in Dynasty. Next guy's, I guarantee you he's going to be a Hall of Fame. It's just, it's just, it's just fucking exhausting. And we already fucking knew Jamar Chase was good. And he proved it at the pro day. Four, three, nine, 40 yard dash. Speed score, burst score, agility, it's all there, man. There is no flaw in this man's profile. I will say, I will say, the 201 weigh-in, 201 pounds for Jamar Chase. A little bit underwhelming. I thought he was going to have more of an alpha build, you know, someone like uh, a 210 or a 215-ish. If that was the case, man, he would, the ceiling, the ceiling would be the roof. The ceiling is the roof. Regardless, though, he's he's a beast. Everything that we've wanted to see. If you had any questions about who your wide receiver won, was prior to the pro day, you should be left questionless at this point. Rashad Bateman was and still is my wide receiver too, and is probably most people's wide receiver twos. There were just a lot of erroneous reports going around prior to the pro day about Rashad Bateman's height and weight. You know, they had him listed at 6'2, 210 pounds. And I get it. We all wanted that to be the case. And if he was, if he came in, you know, and had the same testing numbers that he did at his pro day at 6'2, 210, you'd have a, a realistic argument of putting Rashad Bateman over Jamar Chase in the rookie rankings. But that's where the argument stops because Bateman came in at six foot, 190 pounds. So he's not six two, he's six foot. He's not 210 pounds. He's 20 pounds lighter than that. And you hate to see it. I mean, it's fine. It's fine overall. But for someone consistently being compared to like Allen Robinson, who is a legit 215 pounds and bullies motherfuckers on the outside and in the red zone, Rashad Bateman's not there. And I know y'all are going to be like, but he had COVID. One, COVID doesn't fucking shrink you, okay? You don't go from 6'2 to six foot because you have COVID. So I'm sorry for all my short kings out there. The weight, the weight. I wanna, I'm going to put up a video right after Rashad Bateman's pro day, an interview he did 
right after the pro day in which he said, yes, I had COVID in the beginning of 2020. That's why my performance was not up to par. He then goes on to say that at 190 pounds, he is bigger. He's more muscular than he was at 195 pounds. And he was never, he has never, ever, ever, ever in his life been over 200 pounds. Okay. Everybody questioned my speed. Now everybody questioned my weight. Uh, I've never, I've never weighed over 200 in my life. Um, so I'm just gonna come out here and just keep doing my thing. So where'd they get 6'2", 210 for you? I don't know, That's you got to ask, go for football, <laughs> media, PR, uh, I don't know where that comes from. But weighing 190, that's obviously gonna raise some questions. Right. Was that intentional today to weigh in at that level and how much of it all does that affect you? Oh no, the thing about it is like, I weigh 190, but I'm physically bigger than I was at 195. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely okay with that. So the narrative that you guys will continue to recycle that you see on Twitter without doing any sort of research and you just say, oh, he had COVID. That's why he dropped 20 fucking pounds and shrunk two inches. Not true. He's never been over 200 pounds. So the 195, the 190 weight is what Rashad Bateman is. And that absolutely does not mean he can't be good, man. You have tons of really valuable dynasty players, you know, CeeDee Lamb, Stefan Diggs, Tyree Kill, Calvin Ridley, Deontay Johnson that are sub 200 pound receivers. All highly coveted, okay? But I just think it's time to think about Rashad Bateman in a little bit of a different light. So the weigh-in and the height were the notable parts about Rashad Bateman's pro day. Next up, we got Jamar Chase's teammate, Terrace Marshall. Terrace Marshall was like the third fiddle in this LSU offense. And most people know about him by now. If you're into your rookie research, you know, he was one of the guys with the roller coaster that most people didn't know. Then everybody had to make sure that they knew everyone else liked him more than the other guy, whatever. So Terrace Marshall tested really, 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 really well. Again, I still think he's got some concerns there. Never more than the wide receiver three at LSU while the other two big names, Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson, were there. And a huge percentage of his dominator rating until he obviously became the only guy there this previous year, right? He was a third-year player. He was uh, Jamar Chase was gone. Justin Jefferson was gone. He was the only guy, and then he finally broke out. But his dominator rating early on, he did have an early breakout age, but his dominator rating early on, high, 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 high percentage of that came from touchdowns, okay? So dominator rating is basically the percentage of your team's yards, touchdowns like production from the receiver position that you had relative to the rest of the team so if you have a big dominator rating it means you had a high percentage of your team's touchdowns receiving yards things like that a huge percentage of his dominator rating the early breakout age came from touchdowns which is a concern right as we talk about this in the nfl all the time like you can't predict touchdowns you can't predict fantasy players doing well from touchdowns but if you know what a player is going to do in terms of receptions and yardage you give yourself a floor and then you hope he hits the ceiling with the touchdown so Terrace Marshall the profile I think has a few more red flags and people are willing to admit but this is all about pro day this is about the testing and I'll tell you what those speed bumps on the player profile for Terrace Marshall look beautiful and they look a lot like they look a lot like another former LSU outside lean long wide receiver that goes by the name of DJ Disc Jockey Chark playing hits, making hits. I expect both these guys to be doing that at the pro level for a very long time. So Terrace Marshall, definitely a winner at LSU's pro day. Elijah Moore, we did a whole ass video last week about Elijah Moore and how he just absolutely blew away the combine. I will link that down below if you want to know a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more about him. I'm on Ra St. Brown out of USC. People were big mad at me when I said this. I'm on Ra St. Brown is just Willie Sneed with the hyphen. And then what did he do at his pro day? He went out and ran a slower 40-yard dash than Willie Sneed. I didn't even think that was possible. I, I feel like Willie Sneed walks when he's on the football field. No, but in all seriousness, Amon Ross St. Brown, his burst, his burst was nice. He'll be a much better playmaker in the slot. He's quicker. He's more agile, uh, more big plays for sure. I just, you know, Amon Ross was just never a guy that I really bought into. I think like... He did well in the slot at a young age when he had to be the guy and had to move outside and be an all-around versatile wide receiver. I think he struggled a little bit. So I'm on Ra. The testing numbers tell me that he's slow and he probably won't succeed on the outside as a, a semi-smaller prospect who doesn't have long speed. Um, so I think that's just something to note. Anytime a guy who's very hyped up runs like a four six six or whatever, and he's not you know six four two hundred fifteen pounds, the opposite of that is Anthony Schwartz out of Auburn. A 4-2-7 adjusted to a 4-3-2. He was an all-world sprinter, so this should be no surprise. Uh, coming out of Auburn, we knew that he was probably going to be the fastest player or the fastest skill player uh, to run at the pro days. 
I think he's a good football player. I think a team that drafts him is going to be drafting him specifically to add speed to the offense. I don't think anyone's building a passing offense around him. I think he could be a role player. So I'm not, you know, we, we've seen this time and time again. The fastest guy almost never equates to the best football player. And I think this is the case for Anthony Schwartz. I think he's good. I think he's fine. When you look at a guy like Tutu Atwell, right? Anthony Schwartz built his game around speed. Tutu Atwell is the same. Tutu Atwell is a small receiver out of Louisville, okay? And we've seen... I've seen him mocked in the first round of the first round of the actual NFL draft multiple times in the last couple of weeks. I think Mel Kuyper had him in the first round. Tutu Atwell broke out at a young age. Very, very good statistically. We didn't know what he was going to weigh in at. You know, we had seen his playing weight be between 165 and 170. This dude weighed in at 155 at his pro day. So I'm not a guy who's like, you know, the weight thing yeah yeah here's an outlier here's my fucking model projections and never have we seen a hit about someone who's 106 like fuck them people but 155 pounds i'm out for that reason i am out too optimistic i'm out i think you're doing the right thing but i'm out i just don't see the vision on this one i'm out wouldn't put my money there i'm out i'm going to pass i'm i'm out just so i'm out drive me nuts i'm out so i am out so i'm out i am so out on this i'm out i'm out no shit last guy i want to touch on this one hurts a little bit tamari and terry out of florida state man uh i loved him i did a, another whole video on him you know it was on the basis of what he was going to come in at in terms of like weight and height and things like that he was supposed to be an absolute specimen we're talking about 6'4", 220 pounds, running a fucking 4, 3, 8, 40 yard dash. Not the case. He comes in at the Florida State Pro Day, 6'3". So a little bit a little bit less tall, a little bit shorter. Uh, that would be the word for less tall. Not a, not a big deal, but 207 pounds, not 220 pounds. Runs a 4'5'0 instead of a 4'3'7". He's tall. He's not abnormally fast, uh, without agility, without burst, and, and, he, and he's fucking old. So he went from outside alpha to uh, skinny slot wide receiver real quick and you know he dropped pretty far in the rankings for us which again are available on bdge.store though uh, I still think he could be good I still think he'll be uh, a fun upside flyer depending on the draft capital if he goes in like the seventh round obviously not but maybe someone takes a flyer on him in the third fourth round because he was a player just last year that was getting first round NFL draft buzz and uh, these weigh-ins did not help I don't know how I left out Rondell Moore. I'm editing this, and I realize I uh, left out the person who probably fucking had the greatest pro day possibly in history, except for his fucking height. The guy came in at 5'7". He's going to have problems in the NFL. He's going to have problems on fucking dating apps. 5'7", it's an issue. He's arguably the most athletic player in this class, if not the last fucking 5'7 classes. Uh, explosive in every way imaginable, but the size becomes a problem at the nfl level right five eight five nine five ten you can work with five seven gets dicey so rondell moore is a winner in some aspects a loser in other aspects i think it's going to come down to the t if he goes to a team where he's inserted right into the wide receiver two role where he's actually playing you know 80 percent of the snaps i don't care how small he is if he's on the field for 80 percent of the snaps beautiful taking fucking snaps at running back or something going to be a problem okay so Rondell Moore keep an eye on where he actually goes to coming in a 5-7 problem the explosiveness the athleticism unsurprising but fucking amazing let's move to the running bikes Travis Etienne Travis Etienne came in thick 215 pounds of straight bloat probably Ran a four five zero flat. A lot of people thought he was going to come in and run, you know, somewhere in like the the high four threes, very low four fours. I think it's a give and take here. I think ETM probably played most of his days at Clemson between two hundred five and two ten, and probably was running between a four three eight and four four three when he was weighing in at that at that weight. Uh, nonetheless, I think the two hundred fifteen. I'll take the speed being a little bit lower to have a higher weight because that means teams will look at him as a three down back. You know, when you're two hundred fifteen pounds, you're talking about a guy ETN who's. I think you can comp relatively securely to a guy like Alvin Kamara, where if a team wants to give him 13, 15 carries a game plus five or six targets, he's going to do some damage, right? 215 pounds. He's got the size to do it now. Four or five speed is not slow. It's slower than what we thought it was going to be for him, but it is not slow at all. So that 215 pound gives you that three down workhorse upside potential for a guy like ETN. So I think despite some people thinking he's a loser from the combine, which I don't know how that makes sense, I would say he's a winner. Um, Najee Harris didn't test. None of these fucking Alabama dudes tested. Demonte Smith didn't test. Jalen Waddle didn't test. Najee Harris, all fucking cowards. None of them tested, so we don't actually have any of their athletic measurables. 
I don't think we really needed it for Najee Harris. I don't think anyone expected him to come in it. We needed it for Smith. We needed it for Waddle because we wanted to know their weight. We wanted to know their height. We wanted to know their speed. Those things matter for those guys. Najee Harris, I, and we know he's fucking big. He, he weighed in at the senior bowl as well. We didn't have a 40 time, but that wasn't make or break for Harris. We're not, uh, Harris's game is not home run ability. Harris's game is not breaking away with four, four, five speed or anything like that. So I'm not too concerned with Harris there uh, at all. When we get past ETM, when we get past Javante Williams, when we get past Najee Harris, Javante Williams actually had a, a pretty disappointing pro day as well. I think he ran like a four, five, eight, possibly adjusted to four, six, three. Um, so he's a little more sluggish than I think people are uh, letting on. But after those three, right, we've had this, we've been talking about how after after the big three, there's a huge tear drop off. And it gets to those middling running backs where some guys like, you know, it's Kenneth Gainwell, it's, it's uh, Jamar Jefferson, it's Chuba Hubbard. In my opinion, all those fucking dudes were losers on the pro day. They were all dudes that I had pegged way behind the second tier of wide receivers. So you've got the three running backs. You've got all these quarterbacks and super flex. You've got the top wide receivers and Chase and Bateman and uh, Demonta Smith and Waddle and those guys. And then all the second tier wide receivers as well. The Elijah Moores, the Terrace Marshalls, those guys that I would be taking way over these second tier running backs. And like, I think it was proven at their pro days. Like Gainwell came in. Kenny Gainwell out of Memphis came in over 200 pounds. So that was a huge win for everybody. Everyone was going nuts because he weighed 201 pounds. The guy ran a 4.52 40 yard dash. Okay. People were ecstatic about him hitting 200 pounds because he played at Memphis at probably like 190, 195. And he took the year off. He, he opted out for COVID. And we're like, okay, maybe he took the year to bulk up a little bit, put some size on, and become a more versatile, a more, you know, acclimated to the NFL in terms of putting some muscle on so he could stay on the field for all three downs because he's an excellent pass catcher, right? Nothing taken away from that. But I think that's all that needs to be said is that we're getting ecstatic that he hit 200 pounds, right? Like, that's what he is. He's a 200-pound, 4 5 40-yard dash guy. I get it. He's a great pass catching back, but he's he has bad speed. He's small, bad burst. And I see more like J.D. McKissick than I do, you know, Austin Eckler or anything like that. So Kenny Gainwell, in my opinion, despite the 200-pound hitting on his fucking weigh-in, not a winner at the pro day. Chuba Hubbard, also a huge fucking loser. Chuba Hubbard was never really good, okay? These 2,000-yard scrimmage seasons in college are a dime a fucking dozen. And I see all the comps being thrown out now about Philip Lindsay or Tevin Coleman, and they're like, oh, I wonder who came up with the comp first. I did. All y'all running victory laps on your comps only because I'm not on the fucking track anymore. I took my shoes off, and I've been resting on the couch for the last nine months. I pegged Chuba Hubbard as a terrible running back. Not a terrible. Okay, let's, I'll, let me pull the reins back. He's not a terrible running back, but he's not good. He's straight up. He's not elusive. He's supposed to be fast, and and that's the problem, okay? The reason he's a loser at the pro day is because everyone said he was going to come in at the 4-3. You know what's so fucking funny? Their, their, their team, like Oklahoma State, just tweeted out, Chuba Hubbard ran a 4-3-6 unofficial. And those other Twitter accounts are like, oh, Chuba Hubbard just ran a 4-3. The official pro day numbers come in. He runs a 4-5-3. 4-5-3, uh, and, and that was his call. His calling card was straight speed, breakaway, home run ability, and now he doesn't have that. Okay, so you take away, you have no elusiveness. You don't have the home run ability. Chuba Hubbard, huge loser at the pro day for Oklahoma State. Chuba Hubbard, going to drop in my rankings pretty significantly, as is Jamar Jefferson. You want to talk about speed being a calling card. Jamar Jefferson's a guy who also not elusive. 9.8% broken tackle rate per Sports Info Solutions. They do a lot of the advanced analytics where they're actually charting college players. 9.8% broken tackle rate. So one out of every 10 carries, is he breaking a tackle on the ground? That was 110th out of 114th. So in the write-up I had for Jamar Jefferson prior to the pro day, before we knew any of the numbers, my big concern was I said, okay, he could still be a very good NFL running back if that long speed actually comes in. He's a player where the 40 time I don't want to say make or break, but is a huge impact on his profile as a prospect. Because if you're not elusive and you're not very big, then you better be fucking hitting the hole hard and you better be hitting it with long speed. Because in college, that's what he did. He was either, you know, gaining three or four yards or he was gaining 40, 50 yards. And my my problem with that is like when you are not in like the SEC, he wasn't in a terrible conference, but like when you are in college breaking away home run plays, we see it with Darrell, we saw it with Darrell, we see it with, uh, I was going to say Darrell Henderson, sorry, I have fucking... Uh, I'm, I'm a huge spaz right now, but getting very excited, worked up about Jamar Jefferson. When you see these college players racking up crazy statistics because they're breaking away long runs, a lot of that time, it's because the offensive line is opening up big holes and you have good speed. So I was like, okay, if Jamar Jefferson can actually put up 4-4 four, four flat speed, that's legit NFL speed. He did not do that. Not only did Jamar Jefferson come in slow, uh, four five five adjusted to four six zero 
But he was supposed to be like 215 to 218 pounds. He came in at 206 pounds. So he dropped weight and got slower. Huge problem. He's also not a good receiving back. So this pro day was was a disaster for Jamar Jefferson in my eyes. This class is not shaping up like we thought it would be in terms of like having the middle tier of running backs being solid and the high end wide receivers being really good. Not looking like that right now, which leads me to a couple of risers though, okay? So maybe the top end wasn't as good as we thought, but there are some dudes underneath that will push the floor up. First off is Elijah Mitchell. Elijah Mitchell was one of the, one of my favorite prospects. Dating back almost a, you know, a couple months now, I made the video on just Elijah Mitchell in a way that cu- that that's going to sound fucking weird now because we had all thought we had been given numbers from their school, from Louisiana Lafayette, Elijah Mitchell running back Louisiana Lafayette, that he was 215 to 220 pounds. So I'm saying, okay, this dude is a three down workhorse that most people don't know about because he goes to a small school. However, this dude comes in at 201 pounds. I don't know what happened. I mean, I, maybe, the, you know, the, it's a happy Passover. A guy's name is Elijah. He's been fasting for the last month or some shit, but he drops down from 218 to 201. My excitement behind Elijah Mitchell was like, oh, we got a dude who's got three down workhorse upside that most people don't know about because the size is there. He could be, a th- he could legitimately stay on the field for all three downs. Now he moves down to 201 pounds. Luckily, not luckily, but fortunately for people that have Elijah Mitchell, who were targeting him, his athleticism was off the fucking charts. This dude ran a 4-4-0 flat. So at two, 201 pounds, might not seem as impressive, but it was actually the highest, the best weight adjusted speed score of any running back in the class. So this guy blew away his athletic numbers. I'm really not sure what to make, uh, make of Elijah Mitchell now. Because no longer is he going to be the 215, 220 pound three down workhorse. He's now a fast, small, athletic back with, you know, I, I don't even know. You look at some guys that are, are in that mold. It's like, I mean, you could look at like Reggie Bush. You could look at Austin Eckler. You could look at guys like that. And I guess that could be his upside. It's just, it's just so not what I saw on film. It just feels fucking schizophrenic talking about Elijah Mitchell this way, okay? So Elijah Mitchell, his athleticism, the way he, I could not have pegged, if you showed me this profile blank and you said, who do you think this is? Elijah Mitchell might have been the last dude that I pegged to have this profile, okay? So I guess he's a winner. I don't really know. Draft capital is going to be massive for Elijah Mitchell. The next dude up whose draft capital is going to be massive is Trey Sermon, man. He's worth talking about. I don't. He didn't have like a relatively not, notable pro day, but I talked about it on Twitter for a little bit, and no one thought he was fast. But he weighs in at 215 pounds, right? Trey Sermon out of Ohio State. Sorry, I keep feeling like you guys all know all these players. Trey Sermon out of Ohio State broke out towards the end of the year. He had that like four game stretch where he was an absolute animal. You want to talk about Sermon? He was fucking giving sermons on the field. Trey Sermon, Ohio State, comes in at 215 pounds. With really good agility, really good burst. And what that unique skill set does in my eyes is puts him in the range, the spectrum of guys in terms of upside, Josh Jacobs, Kareem Hunt, James Robinson, okay? Not necessarily flashy, but they're big, they're elusive, they can move between the tackles, and they're just all around underrated backs. And that's how I see Trey Sermon playing out at the upper echelon of his spectrum okay i'm not saying i'm projecting him to be that guy and when you look at those comps the cool thing about it is draft capital didn't fucking matter like josh jacobs first round pick but kareem hunt third round pick james robinson undrafted in reality the nfl doesn't care how slow you are in the 40 yard dash as long as you thick and you could fucking wiggle like jello and that sermon can do sermon has been in the top of the country in terms of elusive rate and broken tackle rate per many advanced analytics website that I've looked up. More detail on that in his profile in our Dynasty Rookie Draft Guide on bdge.store. He was never a burner. Not in college. He won't be in the NFL. He won with like subtle quickness at the line of scrimmage and between the trenches. He makes quick moves in very tight spaces, hence the agility score being high, and he blows through the line for those 8 to 17 yard gains hence the burst score okay the more I think about Trey Sermon the more I like this kid I hope he gets day late late day two early early day three draft capital if he starts going the fifth sixth round obviously we got problems but I like Trey Sermon man and it's hard to to like Ramondre Stevenson anymore this one fucking hurts man y'all know I like the big boy from Oklahoma but he ran a four six nine with very little athleticism outside of an okay agility score His upside, I thought, prior to the pro day was that of like Eddie Lacy and and Carlos Hyde, but those numbers just ain't ain't up to par to 
to pull that off. So he's obviously moving down the rankings. He's someone I'm going to keep a close eye on. Uh, I, I do think he showed really, really, really well at Oklahoma. I, I think he flashed three down ability and he's really big. So he can be a three down workhorse if a team were given him a chance. But his athleticism numbers tell a different story. Chris Evans, this kid out of Michigan. And I'll be honest, man, I have yet to scout him. He is the only player on this entire list that I haven't watched the games for, looked through the statistics, production, looked at the history, looked at the athletics, like all that kind of shit. Chris Evans out of Michigan. I still have yet to scout him. His profile will be up in the in the rookie guide later this week, if not early next week. But this kid balled at his workout at his uh, Michigan Pro Day. Came in at 210 pounds, decent 40, but great burst and agility, much older prospect. He'll be borderline fucking 24 years old when the season starts. He came into Michigan in 2016, so he's been there for like five fucking years, and he never really had a breakout year. Honestly, the more I look at his profile outside of measurables and athletics, the more absolutely disgusting it becomes. But this is about the combine, and my guy fucking did it up. My guy did it up, okay? So those are running backs I thought were notable. Of course, I mean, listen, everybody had a pro day, so we could sit here and talk about every single fucking pro day and every number and every 40 and every agility score and all that kind of stuff, but these are the notable ones that stood out to me. I'm just trying to get y'all familiar with the rookies in the class. I think overall, it was a disappointing pro day for wide receivers, for running backs, for the overall talent pool, okay? Tight ends, Kyle Pitts did what Kyle Pitts was supposed to do, blew the fucking combine away, going to be a first-round pick, going to be a top-ten pick most likely. You have the tight end from Penn State, Pat Fryermuth. I think I'm saying that correctly. Tight end two in almost everybody's rankings. He did not work out at the pro day because he's recovering from shoulder surgery. And then you have Brevin Jordan, who is most people's tight end three in the class. He had a disappointing pro day for all things considered. So not great behind Kyle Pitts. Hunter Long at a Boston college though. He is a tight end to keep an eye on. He's 6'5", 254 pounds. Did pretty well at the combine. More importantly, he's got two years of college production. Okay. Two years of solid receiving production at the college level where a lot of these tight end prospects don't even have one fucking year of solid college production. We're just going off of athletics and measurables and size and shit like that. And we're projecting, but he, Hunter Long, this kid is already one. He has the size to be a three down guy, but two, he has back-to-back -back years of good college receiving production. So he will be my tight end four in this year's rookie tight end rankings. You don't really need to know too much behind those guys, but we will get more in depth in the dynasty rookie guide, obviously again, for the 17th time available on BDGE dot store. Everything's available on there. Merch is available on there. The draft guides available on there. Patreon memberships available on there. That's all we got for today. I got to skedaddle the fuck up out of here and go check out some apartments, new HQ incoming in 27 days. I love y'all. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit the thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. If you're new, we'll be breaking down rookie dynasty season long kind of content shits all spring, all summer, all fall, all winter. Until next time, sirs and sirettes, 